Well, good morning, Evanston Bible Fellowship. Welcome to the EBF Virtual Sunday Gathering. My name is Jeff Estes. I'm the Director of Music and Communications here at EBF. I'm so glad you decided to join us this week. Uh, if this is your first time with us, let me say a special welcome to you. Um, thanks for taking time out of your Sunday to, to spend with us. Um, and you can find our service, the order of our service. You can actually watch the video of our service if you want to in the Church Center app. Um, where you can you can download the app on onto your phone or your iPad or whatever wherever you are, um, you can find the link for it in the description below. Um, and the reason we suggest that is you can you can fo follow along with the order of our service on there. You can give on there. You can re read the readings on there. Um, so it's an important part of the the life of our church. So you'll be able to find our call to worship on there this morning. It'll also be on the screen as it normally is. But our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 59, 14 through 20. Listen to this. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own, own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in, in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastland, he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you worship the Lord through song with us this morning? Your kindly rule. Your kindly rule. Has 
have seen the double cure. See from wrath and make me pure. Not the Today, our lesson will be from John 20, 24 to 29. For the past few weeks, we have seen Jesus appear to his disciples after his resurrection. We learned about how they felt and how they responded to him. And last week, we learned that there was a special job for them to do. This week, our story focuses on, the, on one disciple in particular. One of the disciples had a hard time believing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And he said he wouldn't believe unless he saw Jesus for himself. In our video, we'll see how Jesus responds in compassion toward him. And we're going to hear about the importance of belief. Okay, I'll be back in just a moment. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples, but he was not with the others when Jesus visited them. The other disciples kept telling him, we have seen Jesus, but Thomas doubted. He said, I don't believe you. I want to see and touch the holes in his hands and his side, or I will never believe. Eight days later, and the disciples were indoors again. This time, mm. Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them. He said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out and touch my side. Don't be an unbeliever, believe. Whoa. Thomas did believe. My Lord and my God, he said. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Those who believe in me without seeing me are blessed. Thomas saw Jesus for himself. He saw that Jesus had been raised from the dead and was alive. He saw Jesus' scars from the cross where Jesus died for our sins. 
we have not seen Jesus. But Jesus said, if we believe in him without seeing him, we are blessed. Welcome back. In our video, we learned that the disciple who doubted was Thomas, and Jesus had him touch his hands in his side to believe that he really was alive. Jesus tells us that those who believe without seeing are blessed. Talk as a family about this question. How did Jesus respond to Thomas and his doubts? How does Thomas respond after he realizes it is Jesus? Okay, last week your memory verse was from Mark 16, 15. And this week it is John 20, 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I'll say that again. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Lastly, pray as a family today and thank God that Jesus really rose from the dead and pray for God to help you if you ever have any doubts or questions about that. Thank you and have a great week, everyone. This morning's scripture reading is from Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hey, good morning, EBF. Uh, my name is Robbie Givergeese. I serve as one of the elders here. Uh, if we haven't met before, welcome. Thanks for joining us in worship. Um, it's a joy to be able to be in God's word with you today. And uh, uh, Pastor Tim and I, along with the rest of the elders, want to just let you know that uh, we miss you. Uh, we can't wait to be back together again. Uh, and we've been praying for you diligently. Uh, well, you know, it seems like every week there's so much to lament about our world that we live in, isn't there? You turn on your news or you turn on your phone and the pervasive nature in, of sin and its consequences seem to be at the forefront of everything. Even as we consider the trial uh, surrounding George Floyd, we are aware of just the frequent instances of systemic injustice with deep roots in our history and the culture, and it just seems to happen on repeat. As followers of Christ, it's, it's hard not to be aware of the real kind of spiritual battle that we are in, isn't it? And it's not just flesh and blood, but it's this truly dark and spiritual forces that we're dealing with. Even at times when justice seemingly prevails, it can still feel overwhelming. And we long for so much more as we wait for true justice and for the Lord to return and put an end to the darkness and evil that's in our world. This week in the final part of the letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul turns to talk directly about these things, the spiritual realities and the present darkness that we face. And it gets kind of heavy sometimes, but my hope is that we, when we examine this passage, that it would minister to us. That even as uh, we are reminded of the evil that's raging around us, that we would be seeing the encouragement that God's Word gives to us in it. For when our hearts and our bodies grow weary and crying out to the Lord, the Lord's promises are enough. Would you pray with me? Father, would you illumine your word to us this morning? Thank you for being the good shepherd of this church. For even in times of uncertainty, you lead us beside still waters, and you continue to refresh our souls. Lord, we bring to you our weariness, and we acknowledge our need for you. Would you lead us and strengthen us in light, in light of the victory that you have given us through your Son, Jesus? And Father, would you equip me to faithfully share your word today? May the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Amen. Well, one of the uh, first uh, Christian authors I was introduced to as a new believer at 19 years old was C.S. Lewis. Uh, I remember reading uh, the screw tape letters. Uh, reading it early on in my faith, I was really fascinated by it because uh, even though it's a work of fiction, I remember being amazed that Lewis put so much thought and consideration into the mind of the, of the devil and his demons. It's about uh, a senior devil instructing a junior devil in the art of temptation. The senior devil named Screwtape is writing letters to his nephew Wormwood, instructing him in all the different schemes and tactics and how demons should lead Christians into sin. Lewis gives some, uh, gives some instruction at the beginning of the book that's actually really thoughtful. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can, fell, can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. It's easy to fall into one of these buckets, isn't it? Uh, there are some of us that can be so overcome and, uh, and overwhelmed with fear, anxiety around the spiritual realm to the point where that's all we think about. We tend to have a, an unhealthy preoccupation with it sometimes even thinking more about Satan than we do Jesus. And there are others, uh, particularly in the Western world, and this might relate to us more in Evanston, who sometimes can be so consumed with our everyday lives, that, you know, our careers and our families and our finances, that it's hard to even spend time thinking about the spiritual realm, isn't it? Paul's letter to the Ephesians is all about the unity of, church and, of the church in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit according to God's plan. The first half of it uh, shows the grand vision of the cosmic unity that we have in Jesus. And the second half of it shows how to live in light of that unity in Christ. And we continue that today as we open up uh, Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Paul shows us how to properly view the spiritual realm. He tells us that the light of Jesus' ultimate victory on the cross, in light of that, we still need to endure the battle that remains on earth, and we need to be prepared for it. In our time together, we'll be encouraged and challenged as he reminds us of three things. One, we are to endure the battle that remains with the strength that comes from the Lord. Two, we are to take time to understand who the real enemy is in our battles. And three, finally, when we've done all that we can in battle, we can expect to stand firm in his strength. As Paul nears uh, the end of his letter, he closes with a final series of admonitions. And the first one was to be strong in the Lord. He says in the, in the passage, starting in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Paul makes it clear here that the strength that we need to stand on does not come from our own strength. Our strength must come from the Lord. Paul's encouragement to be strong in the Lord is, is brought up earlier in the text as well. Ephesians 1, 19-20 says this, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ, and when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at, at the right hand in the heavenly places. Just a few weeks ago, we remembered and celebrated the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. Every year, that's such a powerful a moment for us as believers, isn't it? First, sitting in somber reflection of Christ's death on the cross, and then waiting in anticipation for Easter Sunday when we can finally rejoice in His resurrection, and we can take joy that His defeat included the, that we can take joy in his defeat of the evil one. Romans 8.11 says this, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Our strength comes from the Lord and from the power of his resurrection. Just think about that for one second. 
sometimes we can treat the resurrection as this once a year kind of powerful moment for us to remember and then just kind of simply move on and forget about it. But it wasn't just a powerful moment. What Paul is saying here is that the supernatural power that overcame death and the evil one continues and it resides in us now through the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful thing. When Paul says to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, it's not just some catchphrase or a slogan. It's a reminder that the well of strength that we draw from doesn't come from us. It's not just a quick recharge. It's not our ability to kind of dig deep and find our inner strength. No, it's the power of the resurrection that lives in us. Christ is alive and in that powerful position of victory, sitting at God's right hand. And for believers, the power is ours to access even now. Paul has assured us uh, through his word uh, that says, God raised us together with Christ and seated us together with him in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus. So we share in Christ's victory. Not only does God provide us with his own power, but he also provides us with his own armor. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand. One commentator, Peter O'Brien, says that Paul likely drew from the imagery of the, the Old Testament passage found in Isaiah 59, 16 to 20. I'll read it. It says, there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered there was no one to intercede. And, it, and his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as cloak. In the context of this passage, God sees that there is no man who can save Israel. Neither is there a man to, to, uh, that is able to intercede and so God goes to battle. He goes to battle himself, and he puts on his own armor to redeem his people. He puts on his breastplate of righteousness. He puts on his helmet of salvation. This is the armor that God wears to accomplish his salvation for his people through his son, Jesus. And now he gives it to us. It's important to note that also that, the, in, that Paul's point here is that we aren't just meant to kind of understand this intellectually, but we're meant to strap this truth on like armor, like put it on us every day. There's a practical aspect to this, and it needs to be put on in our times of prayer and worship in the Lord. In essence, when we put on the armor of God, we are putting on Christ. While we read this passage with a focus on an individual soldier, the ancient world would see the emphasis on a, on, a, on a unit working together for one common purpose. Throughout the letter of Ephesians, Paul is calling us to unity in the church. These are the instructions for our church to collectively put on God's armor. It's not just for an individual warrior. We stand in battle together. The Roman army would often form what's called a phalanx or a wall of shields when they are being attacked on the field. And it was designed to be one of the most effective defenses against their enemies from arrows and spears. If the Romans maintained this formation, they were nearly impossible to beat. But if the enemy was able to break up the ranks, the fight would be even all of a sudden because they would pick off individual soldiers who would be exposed. I saw this played out practically as I spent time in Zambia and Kenya while I worked for World Vision several years ago. I remember visiting with these groups of women uh, in rural uh, Zambia who would join together as business partners uh, and, re and would receive a small amount of money to purchase seeds for a crop or rent a facility to sell a product uh, with the expectation that when they started their business, um, they would pay, and, and the, the business eventually did well, that they would pay that money back so that others could be lifted out of poverty. And usually these loans would be paid back over 97% of the time. And I remember asking one of my Zambian uh, uh, co-workers, uh, you know, how are these women so successful in this? 
And this is what she said. She said, these women are more than just business partners. These women are sisters in Christ. They pray for each other and support one another and see each other's hurts. They see each other as part of one family. Even though they all have their own families to support, they know that if one member of their group is hurting, they're all hurting. And if one member of their group succeeds, it helps them all. What an incredible picture of what our battle could look like if we were in it together. We endure the battle when our strength comes from the Lord, and then we, we also endure when we recognize who the real enemy is. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Paul is saying here that we are wrestling against a formidable foe. Verse 11 talks about the schemes of the devil. He is the head of the demons, the head of the fallen angels who are enemies of God. Jesus calls him a liar and a murderer. He's out to devour us and to deceive us and to take our lives. And he's not alone. Verse 12 goes on to say that he's joined by the rulers against the, against the authorities, against the, pow the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Pastor and theologian uh, Tukumbo Ade Adeyemo says this, There's not just one spiritual being who's our enemy, but a whole range of evil spiritual forces. They vary in rank and authority and responsibility, but they're all opposed to us. These enemies are the spiritual forces behind the world that we live in against the world systems that oppose God. And it's important as believers to recognize that they fight in the spiritual realm and that we need to equip ourselves with the spiritual weapons to fight back. We don't know all the details about these beings, um, who, but we do know some things about them. We know enough to realize that the battle is unseen. We know enough that we know that there are spiritual forces that will come for us if we aren't prepared and if we fight just if for example if we were to fight just against human we would have a chance but against these unseen spiritual forces there's no chance for for our fight without the lord's strength it's also important to note that satan isn't equal to god he is not an equal power but he has been given a certain amount of authority and he is to be taken seriously in John 12, 31, Jesus calls the devil the ruler of the world. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul describes him as the God of this world, little g. When, when Paul speaks about rulers and power, he has this in mind. The demonic, he has in mind the demonic powers of our world, and he's talking about the comprehensive and pervasive nature of these powers. The way that these demonic powers embody our human existence. Tim Keller writes this, when you look at the horrors of the world, whether it's child abuse or genocide or racism, mass shootings or addictions, the powers and principalities are pervasive in all of them. These are not just flesh and blood issues. The underlying power comes from the devil and his demons. When evil does take flesh, when evil does take flesh and blood form in the form of violence and racism and poverty, these things participate in something that's above and beyond something that's just merely human. It really is hard to understand the depth and pervasiveness of this kind of evil without the understanding of these spiritual forces, isn't it? So why should our church care? Why should we actively work against issues like racism that might seem like a worldly issue? Because we believe that the Bible says it's not just a worldly flesh and blood issue. There are underlying pervasive forces at work, and we need to wrestle with them in God's strength. Not only that, but because the gospel not only forgives us and makes us new in Christ, it also disarms these rulers and these authorities. Colossians 2, 13 to 15 says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. You see, Christ's death on the cross not only paid for our sins, but it disarmed the devil and his demons. Our job isn't to do the work that Christ has already done on the cross, but it's to put it into practice, to continue battling against these things, and to bring to bear that which is already a reality through the gospel. The foe wrestles us with clever schemes. Satan and his demons would like to have us believe that the only battle that we face is against flesh and blood things, and he uses clever schemes to do that. He'd like to convince us that the root of our problems isn't him at all. So often we want to put our finger on a source or an issue. We want to identify someone that can be responsible for our problems. It's a particular person or it's a a political party or it's an ideology. We want to name those as our issues. But what Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to help the church discern. He's trying to help us identify the true nature of the fight that we're in. Greg Boyd, who's a a theologian and pastor, said this, One of the main reasons we're so quick to engage in human warfare is because we're we're so slow in engaging in spiritual warfare. Instead of pillaging the enemy's house and taking it back for God, we pillage each other. There's no one who understood this more than Jesus. Jesus was able to see people, uh, he was able to see what people could not see with their eyes. He was able to see the cosmic powers and the realities that were at play. Mark 8, 27 to 32 really gets to the core of this. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And his disciple Peter responds to him saying, you are the Messiah. Jesus goes on to say that the Messiah must die. He must be taken by the authorities and he must suffer and he's going to be raised from the dead. And then the Bible says this, that Peter pulls Jesus to the side and begins to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? And then Jesus looks at Peter and rebukes him right back. He says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You see, Peter didn't have space in his mind for a suffering Messiah. He couldn't comprehend that Jesus' mission was beyond just what he could see with his eyes. He wasn't just an important leader for that day. He was the ruler of heaven and earth. Now, Jesus understood that Peter's words were being influenced and, and shaped by a power that was greater than Peter himself. Jesus was able to see that the battle wasn't against flesh and blood here. It was against spiritual forces. Now, it's important to note that Jesus didn't give up on Peter after this account. He didn't toss him to the side and say, you are the devils. But no, he redeemed him. And Peter used him for Christ's Christ's glory. I'm sorry, Jesus used him for his glory. What if we, the church, treated each other like that? It might be helpful to acknowledge uh, this whenever we're in some type of a conflict with a brother and sister in Christ, to just acknowledge that maybe the person that's in front of us is not our enemy. Sometimes we go into a hard conversation with a brother and sister, and uh, what if we just said on the onset, can we just agree that we are not each other's enemy? Can we say that we can seek to resolve this issue in a way that the powers of darkness do not win? What if we began hard conversations saying, yes, we've got some difficult things, biblical things to work through, but can we acknowledge that there are some larger realities at work here seeking to divide us? Now, this doesn't mean that we don't get angry at each other or we are suppressing reality in some way, but at least we acknowledge and are aware and have discernment that there are powers at play. When we understand who the real enemy is, we keep him from gaining a foothold in the body of Christ. Paul instructs us to endure the battle that remains, take time to understand who the real enemy is, and finally, when we've done all that we can in battle, 
He tells us to stand firm. Verse 13 reads, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. How do we stand firm? Here Paul tells us again that we have to stand firm together. To put on the full armor of God. We'll talk about more. Uh, we'll talk more about what these individual pieces of armor look like next week. But he's stressing again the importance uh, and the need to practically arm ourselves every day with the truth of the gospel. These instructions are for the church collectively to put on God's armor to stand shoulder to shoulder in battle every day, because the evil day is coming for every follower of Christ, and we all need to be armed and ready, but we don't need to fear it. When we grasp the reality of our union in Jesus, we realize that we are united to one another as part of Christ's own body. And we all have to persevere whenever it comes for any, when the evil day comes for any of us. The powers of evil are pervasive, no doubt, but we believe that the gospel is even more pervasive. So much more that our ethos statements at EBF, one of our ethos statements is a belief in a pervasive gospel, a gospel that can go anywhere and change anything to the depths of our souls, to the ends of the earth. Because that's what Jesus did for us. He went to the depths of the earth for us. And as we engage in these battles, we stand firm because we know that our battle still matters to Jesus. What well, Paul tells us to put on the armor of God, we can only do that because Jesus first emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant, Philippians 2.7 tells us. Well, well Paul tells us to uh, not just wrestle with flesh and blood, Jesus strips himself of everything to become flesh and blood, John 1.14 says, and he wrestles for us. And when when Paul tells us to be strong, Jesus first had to become weak. He had to collapse in the cross so that we can find strength in his victory. Jesus not only knows what it feels like to wear the armor, but he knows how you feel when you have no more strength to stand. And yet he calls us to him. Even now, I know there were many of us in our congregation who are deeply entrenched in different battles. For some of us, it's a physical battle. For others, it's a battle for mental health. And for others, it's the immense weight of racial, racial injustice in our lives. And for others, it's a battle raging to destroy your marriage and your families. Whatever the battle that you are facing, know that it matters to Jesus. He'll give you strength to stand firm when you remain in him. And how do you remain in him? You remain when you cry out to the Lord on your knees. We are remaining in him to draw strength that way. When we gather together to pray and to worship with our ethos groups and with, with individuals in our church, we are remaining in him. When we remind each other of the gospel and point each other to Jesus, we are remaining in him and drawing strength from him. When we, when we believe the gospel and experience its power, we are empowered by that same gospel to continue to stand in light of the victory that Christ has won for us. May God help us all to stand firm, to be strengthened, to stand in the struggle and continue to struggle for the advancement of God's kingdom and for the glory of his name. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We stand in awe of his sacrifice on the cross. And through the empty tomb, you have overcome sin and death and evil and have given us strength in our battles. Lord, we cry out to you. We acknowledge the frailty of our lives and our dependence on you. And we acknowledge the fear and anxiety that might grip our hearts as we consider the powers and principalities that, are, that we face. And Lord, in those times, would you remind us 
of your presence. That you are our fortress. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. Help us to continue our pursuit to bring the gospel to bear on earth until that day when your kingdom comes in all its fullness. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So at this point in our gathering, I want to give us an opportunity to give of our tithes and offerings. Um, you can do that by any of the ways that you can see on the bottom of your screen now. And, and I just want to remind you that this um, Friday is the end of our fiscal year, the end of our giving year. Um, <clears throat> so if you, want to, if you want your tithes and offerings to be part of this past year, um, please get them in before Friday. And if you need to know more about what we're talking about and about um, the, the giving calendar and, and where we stand as a church uh, financially, you can look at the email that was sent out this past uh, week. Um, and if you have questions, if you, if you need to know more information about it, you can just email ebf at ebfchurch.org and somebody will get back to you uh, to help you with your questions. So take a moment now, give and pray over your gift and pray that God will bless it. See dry bones living again. 
CBF family, my name is Ashley Gilmore and I'm excited to share some announcements with you about what's coming up in the life of our church. Let me begin by saying welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. We're so glad you're here. At EBF, we like to describe ourselves as a community of sojourners empowering one another to cultivate gospel transformation. If you'd like to know more about what that means or about how you can get involved at EBF, I invite you to fill out the connection card, which you can access by scanning the QR code on your screen or clicking the link in the video description below. I have just one main announcement this morning, and that is that Sunday, May 2nd, is the first Sunday of the month, which means that we will be taking communion together as a church family. However, this month, there will be something new. We are going to have a hybrid of in-person and online avenues for participation. Both will begin at noon. If you would like to join in person, we will be meeting at Lighthouse Beach Park, and we just ask that you register on the Church Center app and read the health and safety guidelines ahead of time. We will have individual communion supplies available at the park, but you are also welcome to bring your own. If you would prefer to join virtually, we'll send out the Zoom link in the weekly update email and you'll be able to participate with us in the park still. That's all we have for today's announcements. As a reminder, to stay in the loop with all of our upcoming events and announcements, please download the Church Center app. Now, receive the benediction from 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. That's all for today. Have a great week, folks.